This is episode 14 of the Everything History podcast, The Death of Maribu and the Birth of Radicalism. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in the name. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Alrighty, welcome back to the Everything History Podcast, and oh, before we get back to the good old-fashioned storytelling, you may have noticed that this episode was number 14, just like the last episode. That was actually intentional, because as I switched servers for this podcast, I was disappointed with the work I did on the English Revolution of 1688. That being said, when I've completed the French Revolution, I will do a retelling of the 1688 Revolution. So worry not, and let's get back to France. I finished by explaining the creation of the Jacobins, the Society of 1789, and the Society of the Friends of the Rights of Man. By the way, the latter Society of the Friends of the Rights of Man is now officially in 1791 known as the Cordeliers Club. I will readdress those political clubs in just a moment, however, before I do, I need to answer the question I left you all with at the end of the previous episode. Why was revolutionary France still so unstable? Answering that question in full could be an entire book in itself, but allow me to create a general answer to that very interesting question. Why is it that France after its 1789 revolution is unstable? Why does it seem to keep imploding and stumbling at every turn? How is it that the country can go from festival to rioting in a mere amount of days? Well, it comes down to a few very large details. A stable country requires a few essential factors. Leadership, authority, a somewhat united culture, and a grounded economy. I'll run through those one by one. Leadership, that is obviously important. A great leader can unify and even stabilize an entire empire. We know this, of course. Examples include Napoleon, Augustus, Henry VII, etc. Yet, revolutionary France was not lacking in leadership. They had Lafayette, Maribu, and many more intelligent and inspirational figures. So they had leadership, we can check that off. However, revolutionary France lacked authority. In the late 1780s, King Louis XVI had realized this, and the National Constituent Assembly had the same issue in 1789, 90, and 91. And what I mean by a lack of authority is that the National Assembly could not systematically maintain order across France on a daily basis. They had barely kept order in 1789 and 90 in Paris, even with the help of the National Guardsmen. So when it came to farmland, the outer provinces, and the borderlands, how much authority was there? Well, I'll tell you, it was almost non-existent, and this complete lack of nationwide authority makes a nation unstable, because without the presence of government, people are not obliged to pay taxes, conduct business, or obey the rule of law. Moving on, a third point, a stable country, nation, empire, whatever it may be, needs some semblance of a unifying culture meaning the citizens of the state need to feel connected to one another. This can be through religion, ideology, or just plain citizenship. Revolutionary France definitely had this quality. The people were very connected. They were French, not just subjects. They were united through common beliefs of patriotism, liberty, and freedom. However, these unique bonds were new, and as we will see, the bonds between French citizens will prove to be less than secure. Nevertheless, the French did have a cultural identity. It was not entirely stable, but it was definitely there. And my last point, a stable state needs a grounded economy. A grounded economy is one that people can rely on. It does not have to be an exceptional or diverse economy, but it cannot be too unsteady. A grounded economy, as I call it, should have a stable currency, functional trade routes, and provide the necessities without too much interruption or delay. This is where France in the 1790s was incredibly unstable. Their currency was overextended and, as I will soon detail, about to experience a period of hyperinflation. And as you know, they rarely had enough grain to sustain themselves, which was always an issue at critical junctures of the year. Furthermore, they were over-encumbered by debt. This debt was so vast that paying down the interest of their already massive loans was almost requiring more than their annual budget itself. This is sort of like paying off credit card debt with another credit card. 
not exactly a stable fiscal practice. So, in summation, the reason the revolutionary France was still unstable really comes down to two important factors. Number one, the National Assembly and the government was unable to extend authority over their nation. This failure of government opened up opportunities for rebellion and riots and further quote-unquote revolution to occur. And number two, the poor state of their economy, which threatened to undo everything at a moment's notice. And furthermore, these two qualities of a nation-state are the foundations of a society, and when those foundations are damaged, the whole state, in this case France, is unstable. And I'll finish my answer to this question with a metaphor. You can build the greatest, most well-constructed home in the world, but if it was built on poor ground, and nothing is done to address the problem, then it will inevitably collapse. Alright, with that question fleshed out, let's move along with the tale of the French Revolution. We now pass into 1791, and overall, the last year of 1790 had proved to be quite a good year for the French. A notable French politician, Adrien de Coisnoy, puts this in words, saying, quote, Putting aside priests, nobility, magistrates, and financiers, it is clear that all the rest of the kingdom reaps infinite benefits from the revolution. Look and observe, clergy and nobility abolished, provincial privileges gone, ecclesiastical property nationalized, could you have achieved so much? End quote. 1791 will prove to be less successful for France. In fact, in truth, 1790 for France is about to be a complete and total disaster. Yet, all the failures of 1791 are simply the problems of 1790 that finally came to a head. So what were the problems that I speak of? Well, the economy was worsening rapidly as 1791 began because the assignats that the assembly had issued in January of 1790 proved to be not just one-time national bonds. They were being printed as paper money for France. And what did I say about printing paper money a couple episodes back? If it's managed poorly, it leads straight to inflation. In the case of France, it led to hyperinflation within months, making all facets of their currency borderline useless and damaging their economy even further in 1791, 1792, and so on. Also, it turns out that the events of 1790 had prickled a lot of feathers, especially when it came to religion. After all, the National Assembly had nationalized all of the Catholic Church's land and money. As you might imagine, that pissed off most of the clergy and many powerful European figures as well. This was actually worsened even further in November of 1790 when the National Assembly ratified the decree that all clergy officials must swear loyalty to the nation. Those who refused to take the oath were dubbed non-juring priests and would begin to be persecuted in 1791. And why did all this anger the church? Well, to them this ecclesiastical oath was the government getting in between them and God. So that was beginning to divide the people, but a lot of other groups were not content with the events of 1789 1790 either. These folk included the former nobles, women, the royal family, and the conservative French. And all of them will have quite a lot to say in 1791. Now, let's get this story rolling. In January of 1791, the non-juring priests and bishops of France responded to the assembly's new clerical oath law, saying, quote, I declare that my religion does not allow me to take an oath such as the National Assembly requires, end quote. The non-jurists did extend an olive branch, though, saying, quote, We promise to watch over, as well as one possibly can, to be true to the nation and the king, and to observe the constitution decreed by the National Assembly and sanctioned by the king, end quote. Yet they again reiterated at the end of their letter that they could not, in honesty, take a vow that placed the assembly over the holy pontiff and the Lord Jesus Christ. The calming language of the non-juring priests did nothing to create calm. For after only approximately 25% of the priests took the oath, the people of France gained another reason to despise the church and its priests. The people remembered that during the old regime, the clergy had abused the system, and now they thought or feared the priests were trying to disrupt progress again. Also, the political clubs were becoming more and more involved in legislation and governance, particularly the Jacobin Club, which had over 150 members as delegates to the National Assembly itself. The Society of 1789 and the Court of Leaders clubs were very influential too, but both of them were far less influential than the Jacobins. 
And quite frankly, the populace appeared to trust the wisdom of the political clubs more than they did the National Assembly, and that is a very dangerous conflict of loyalties. Nevertheless, as 1791 began, the National Assembly still maintained supremacy, and individuals like Maribu, Lafayette, and Bailly had thus far prevented political clubs from becoming too influential. For now. And the Honorable Maribu was elected president of the National Constituent Assembly on January 30th, 1791, and despite his extravagant language, Maribu was actually quite conservative. Oh, and by the way, conservatism in this context is the political ideology that favored suppressing further revolution and maintaining the status quo of the past. Many French conservatives believed in maintaining the monarchy and feared that disrupting the social order any further would be detrimental to the new French nation. So far, the political clubs were still rather moderate. The Jacobins had radical leaders like Robespierre, but they also had conservative members. The Cordeliers Club, though, was quite radical, but they were not too influential just yet. Yet, even if they were radical, the National Assembly, led by Maribu, was conservative enough to offset their radical proposals. The real radicalism came from the literature and pamphlets of the time, which were still being produced at an insanely rapid rate. The leaders of this media, or at least the loudest and most popular voices, appeared to be Camille Desmoulins and Jean-Paul Marat. I have quoted both in the past, and both were extreme radicals. The problem with their radical literature was that it was aggressively inaccurate. I like that term I just made up. And despite their aggressive inaccuracies, they were extremely popular which is frightening considering how treasonous some of their writings were. After all, Marat had been calling for the king's head quite literally since 1789. The National Assembly at large in the beginning of 1791 wanted to avoid this extreme radicalism and wanted to stop further revolutionary actions. The events of February and March of 1791 actually did the exact opposite. They gave the radicals an opportunity to gain favor. Allow me to reveal how the French government became overrun by fear in the spring of 1791. It began in early February when two relatives of King Louis XVI, the Queen's aunts to be exact, decided to openly protest the laws binding the church and leave France for Rome. The pamphleteers were all over this, describing the trip as unpatriotic and anti-revolutionary. And soon everyone was talking about it, and many wondered if this was actually a probe by King Louis to see if he could escape the country. So much so that citizens in Paris began to meet in large numbers to discuss preventing the two royals from leaving, and they threatened force if necessary. The National Assembly was going to simply let the excitement die down, but in mid-February, the Jacobin Club and the Cordeliers Club began promoting action against the two royal ladies if they decided to embark. And when they did leave, the people rose up in violence, spurred on by the printing press, the Jacobins, and the Cordeliers, crowds of people surrounded the royal households in Paris and threatened violence if any of the royals tried to quote-unquote escape. Lafayette and the National Guard arrived and dispersed the riot, and the National Constituent Assembly now took the matter up to debate. Indeed, in late February, the Assembly actually debated a law to regulate the movements of their citizens. In simpler terms, France was now debating whether or not anyone had the right to enter or leave France at their own discretion. Looking back, I cannot help but see this as ridiculous. The whole revolution had supposedly been about freedom and the rights of their citizens, but the government was about to rule on whether or not anybody had the quote-unquote freedom to move as they so pleased. And I don't mean to paint the government in a corner because the people actually largely supported this measure. And I find this all very counterintuitive, and so did the Honorable Maribu. The president of the assembly was visibly upset and angered by the very proposition. He rose and scolded the delegates, reminding them that people were not livestock or pieces of land. They were free, as dictated by the rights of man that this very assembly passed. And Maribu chastised the rioters and those who incited such violence, describing their behavior as, quote, barbaric, and warned the radicals that if they did not conduct themselves by law, then they would lead France to despotism and tyranny once more. Maribu did get his way, and the proposal was rejected, but his harsh language had angered many of the radical and moderate delegates, especially after several Jacobins had tried to interrupt Maribu's dictation, to which Maribu screamed, quote, silence, I say to the thirty voices in the corner. When the meeting was over and the law formally rejected, the Jacobins were enraged by Maribu, Lafayette, and the other quote-unquote conservative delegates of the assembly, 
In early March, those same men, the conservatives, were accused of wanting to destroy the Jacobin Club and published thousands of pamphlets labeling Maribu as a traitor to the revolution. Most did not believe such slander, but this proved to be a turning point in France because from March of 1791 onwards, French radicals led by the Jacobins were on the rise. Yes, the politics of the Jacobins were beginning to really infiltrate the public mind and even the government now. And what was the appeal of the Jacobins and the other radicals? Fear. They used fear to convince people that they were in the right. And what did the average French citizen fear? They feared a counter-revolution and the return of nobility and the authority of the old regime. Promoting themselves as guardians of the revolution while painting their enemies as noble aristocrats clinging to the royal feudalism of the past. And anything the radicals of the Jacobins proposed was suspiciously always to further the goals of the revolution, even if it actually did the opposite. Ugh, even talking about the political machinations of the Jacobins actually kind of physically frightens me. Really, the Jacobins are terrifying. Not so much in early 1791, but in the coming years, it's the Jacobin party, particularly its radicals, that end up reigning through terror. And let this be a lesson to you all. If a political entity ever plays to your fears, do not trust it. Seriously, do not trust anything or anybody that manipulates people through fear. I have a few examples in mind. Senator McCarthy, who used communist fears to further his own interest in the 1950s of the United States, and also the entire U.S. Congress in the early 2000s, who used people's fears of terrorism to go to war and authorize mass worldwide surveillance. I'll remove myself from my soapbox now and get back to the story. Yes, radicalism was now on the rise, but the National Assembly still had Maribu to counteract the movements of the Jacobins. Actually, that is not entirely true, for in late March, the Honorable Maribu was stricken by illness. He attempted to conduct affairs as usual, but eyewitnesses in the Assembly described his appearance as akin to a ghost. His face was pale, his voice failing, and his hair dying. On April 2nd, that became a reality when the great revolutionary leader, Gabriel Rukethi Maribu, died of organ failure throughout his body at the age of 42. All of Paris then went into mourning for their fallen leader, and he was entombed in the Pantheon of Paris. And it is said that 300,000 people, draped in black, flocked to his funeral procession, and a one Monsieur Rault said, quote, It seemed as if we were traveling with him into the world of the dead, end quote. But France had lost much more than a charismatic leader. They lost one of the last people that could resist the rising tide of radicalism from overtaking French politics. And with Maribu out of the way, the door was open for the radical members of the Jacobin Club to begin taking over the French government. This takeover is not part of some master plan. I don't want to give you that illusion. The Jacobin takeover came in fits and starts after the death of Maribu, and the first fit came during the week of April 18th. For the king and queen wanted to spend Easter at St. Cloud, which is located just outside Paris. But when the people got wind of this, they had mixed feelings. Was the king trying to escape? It was then that the Cordeliers and the Jacobins got involved once more. Many of them accused the king of preparing to extradite himself from France, and incited crowds to withhold the royal carriage. By the way, all sources indicate that the royal family was actually just trying to get away from Paris for a few days. Seriously, St. Cloud is about 8 miles from the center of Paris, and there was no malcontent involved. But nevertheless, on April 18th, the king and queen attempted to leave by carriage, but were stopped by an armed crowd of their own citizens at their gate. Lafayette arrived fashionably late, with a detachment of his National Guard to escort the royals to their destination, but when General Lafayette gave the order, his own guardsmen refused to obey orders. Yes, you heard that right. The guardsmen under the direct command of Lafayette disobeyed orders and sided with the radical crowd. The king and queen's carriage then began to be pelted with rocks and stones, and for over an hour they endured a hail of debris and vicious insults as General Lafayette tried in vain to restore order. The historian Simon Shaman describes the event vividly, taking sources from the king and queen's personal diaries. Quote, The king and queen sat inside the coach enduring ripe abuse. To the crowd and soldiers, they were not much more than the hybrid monster of the poster, quote, the two make but the one, which showed a horned and cuckolded goat man at one end and a plumed hyena woman at the other. When Louis tried to make a little speech expressing surprise that, quote, he who gave the French nation its freedom should now be denied his own, end quote, to which a grenadier of the guard retorted, quote, veto. 
Another told the king that he was a fat pig whose appetite cost the people 25 million a year. The queen sat hunched against the carriage wall, tears of vexation and alarm streaming down her face. End quote. In the end, the king and queen, escorted by Lafayette, resigned in disgrace to return to the royal apartments in Paris. But what does this situation reveal? Well, aside from being a deeply moving tale of royal disgrace, it shows the instability and future radicalism of France. It also reasserts the fact that the king, queen, and their family members were being held hostage. Truthfully, as many of you may already be aware, the royals had been hostages ever since the October days of 1789, and this event confirmed it. When King Louis and Marie Antoinette had been forced to move their residence from Versailles to Paris, they had thenceforth been prisoners within Paris. After all, it was Talleyrand that described the move as a, quote, armed escort, akin to that of criminals being escorted to prison. More than being hostages, this situation revealed the underlying anarchy waiting to burst forth in France. I mean, come on. The people freaked out over the king and queen simply trying to enjoy a Christian holy week in peace. Not to mention that a lot of the people seemed to see the king and queen as this monster that Shama described. In all honesty, King Louis XVI had been the exact opposite of a monster. He'd actually been very well behaved both socially and politically since October of 1789, so the outrage and disgust the crowd revealed towards them showed the true nature of revolutionary France. Not to mention the fact that Lafayette was unable to control his soldiers. Such disobedience makes it startlingly clear that France was again on the precipice. Furthermore, the fact that the crowd had been instigated by slanderous pamphlets and the ravings of Jacobins, Cordeliers, and other radical politicians gives credence to what I explained earlier. Radicalism was about to consume France in a terrifying fury. Okay, I'll halt our story there. The next episode of the Everything History Podcast will not be a continuation of our revolutionary story. Rather, it will be featuring Professor Morrissey, an early American and environmental history professor at the University of Illinois. We will be discussing historical research, early Native American relations in North America, the American Revolution, and much more. Thank you very much.